Well, I'm grateful to get to speak after Jenny and Kirk. I admire them both so much and all their work. And um, grateful to be at each of you, especially you artists here who contributed to this contest and contributed some body of work. It's really cool to see what you did. I got to be one of the many judges, along with Joe Spencer and Daniel and Mark Ellison, a few of my other colleagues, and get to look at all these 96 pieces of great artwork. And Ashley and Jenny asked if I'd speak a little bit about the intersection of art and faith, uh, how they affect each other. I think a lot about how art influences our understanding collectively of God um, as church members of his restored work and uh, informs us. We form a lot of our conceptions of things based off the visual canon that is produced uh, almost often even sometimes more than the written canon. And in that vein, my, my first prophets in my life were painters. And I don't say that lightly. And I don't mean capital P, key-holding prophets, nobody who's doctrinally dogmatic, don't get mad at me right now. I mean by prophets, ones who showed me the way, ones who revealed Jesus to me. They revealed Jesus and his gospel and his teachings. Um, and the history of the Bible and the Book of Mormon and the church through imagery. I've always been an extremely uh, visual learner. And when I would get the enzyme, when it would show up, I didn't read a single article when I was a kid. As a matter of fact, confession of a religion teacher right here, I was on my mission when I learned the general conference was two days long. <laughs> my companion said, hey, let's, we should probably watch conference, and it was Saturday, I'm like, conference it starts on Sunday, bud. <laughs> I didn't know stuff like that, but my family did subscribe to the church magazines, and I would get them, and all I would do is look at the imagery. Um, I wouldn't look at the words, and my first prophets, my first quorum of the 12 apostles, little a, little p, were people like Perry Anderson, Tom Lovell. Ronald Freeberg, Raymond Nerf Tiger, CCA Christensen, Greg Olson, and on and on and on. They're the ones who cause me to wonder and think. Um, so one of the things that I do as both a painter myself um, and as a religion professor is I look at that intersection and I research it and I study it. Um, and I hope in my own small way to contribute to it as well. So I want to share with you a little bit about some of that research that I've done uh, related to it. Jenny shared a little bit about the Book of Mormon, but this is true for all art in our church. There is extremely uh, a small, scant body of work that was produced between 1830 and 1900. I went through every single publication that our church ever did. And by I went through them, I mean I had my research assistants go through every single church publication and make a database for me of any image that dealt with our church's history or our church's doctrine. There's less than three dozen images that were ever produced um, all the way through 1900 that our church officially published in a church magazine or a periodical uh, as a whole. By the way, here's the earliest one that I've ever found that I would consider an artistic image um, as a whole. It's a word, some word art, and without going into it too much, they're trying to say God is love. If you start with the G in the middle and read to the right, it says God is love. If you go backwards, it says God is love. Up or down, it forms a cross. It's kind of a fun idea. Obviously, the woodcut facsimile that was done for the Book of Abraham was one of the earliest artistic images that our church did. This is the first diagram of the plan of salvation, FYI. Looks a little bit different than what we put in Preach My Gospel now. I won't go into the doctrine on this, but it's fascinating. This is Orson Pratt's diagram of the kingdom of God and how the sealing keys and powers bind us up to God. This is how my short summary that I would give of it. It wasn't until 1912, by the way, that the Sunday school books from Plowboy the Prophet that the church first published an artistic vision of the first vision. In other words, it almost took us a hundred years before we even represented the first vision uh, in our church. And there it is right there. 
It's the first visual that a Latter-day Saint artist publicly, the church published. Now there's some like C.C. Christensen and, and others that had approached it, but this was the first one our church published. It wasn't until 1942 that our church ever uh, paint, published um, a painting of the first vision. And we didn't really begin to publish imagery until um, uh, church history of doctrine, until the 20th century. And as Jenny's talked about, that's true for Book of Mormon art too. What I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is that the, our body of work is brand new. But let me get super blunt with you. Our church is brand new. Uh, our church is not even 200 years old yet. Uh, somebody once said there's actually no such thing as Latter-day Saint history, only contemporary events. Um, we are a new church, newly on the scene. We are barely old enough that we're even comprehending ourselves. Um, and that also holds true in my view of our corpus of artwork. Uh, it is just being developed. It is just really started. We have a few early pioneers who have laid groundwork that we're building on but the greatest work is yet to come, in my opinion. It's being crafted and will yet be crafted uh, as a whole. This is uh, Leon Alberti in his classic, uh, it's an old work, uh, when he talks about art and what art does to us. He says, painting contains a divine force, which not only makes absent men present, as friendship is set to do, but moreover makes the dead seem almost alive. Just kind of a cool thought with the Book of Mormon whispering from the dust as a whole. My wife and I this summer we got to go to the Mediterranean. We went to the island of Cyprus. Went to this old Byzantine church. It's over a thousand years old. And walked into this Byzantine church and every nook and cranny and corner was just painted with these beautiful frescoes. Because most of the people, as you know back then, art was very didactic. People did not have access to scripture. They couldn't uh, read it themselves. They were often dependent upon clergy uh, to teach it to them. And so, as, and many of them were illiterate, so they would use artwork on the walls as a didactic form to try to portray and communicate uh, the messages of the Gospels and of Jesus. In other words, what I'm trying to say is painting probably preached the Gospel more than preachers did with words early on. Just such cool frescoes there. And just with a principle, I really like this um, from this book called The Ministry of Art. And it's an interesting idea that art cannot be nobler than the religion that gave it life. And that's a deep concept to reflect on philosophically. Uh, it means the level of our, the beauty of our art will reflect the beauty of who we are as a people and who our faith is uh, as a whole. And it's because art is a reflection of culture. Art's a reflection of who we are uh, as a whole. It's cultural production. So being a little artistic philosophical with you, I want you to think about it this way. Art is a form of social production. Visual culture creates as well as reflects personal and social norms. In other words, whatever a society cares about that society will produce. And if a society doesn't care about or value something, it often won't find itself reflected in its art. To me, art and society interact because culture and the values of a culture act almost like tectonic plates. And as culture and values press on each other, it pushes certain things up into the forefront as a whole. And as those get pushed up, artists are then able to take those um, tectonic forces and create imagery that's reflecting what's going on in the culture. So it's part of it. But also, as artists do that, and they create work, bodies of work for people to look to, then that gives people new uh, mountaintops to stand on, to see something new. Um, and so there's a symbiotic relationship there. If, if you understand what I'm trying to say there. What we value will be emphasized in art, and then what we emphasize in art will become value. Um, artists reflect as well as create culture. And that's
that's not uh, better seen than with CCA Christensen. As Jenny mentioned, he is probably the first person to produce a body of work related to the Book of Mormon. And he tackled these scenes and these subjects. They're not really well known. They're not really well used. His um, ones related to, to church history are a little bit more well known. And here's some of his related to church history that you probably know. And C.C.A. Christensen produced these in the 1870s and 80s as he was trying to get a new generation of Latter-day Saints to understand its foundational teachings um, and its foundational history as well all the way through. And to see how art both is a reflection of culture and impacts culture, I just have to share the story with you. In 1878, there's this young man named George Manwaring. He's a musician. He's trying to make a living as a musician, so he's selling musical instruments, and he travels down to Ephraim, Utah, and he stops by the studio of C.C.A. Christensen. C.C.A. Christensen is working on his Mammoth Panorama series, and he's painting the first vision. That painting is no longer extant, by the way. It likely in the large scroll, in my research of it, Christensen's, all of his works were rolled together in one canvas so they could be unveiled at firesides across a crank that was lit. And he would talk about it as they cranked across. The first vision was likely the outside roll, and it was stored in a warehouse for a long time. So my guess is that uh, in researching those who found his scroll when it was put away for decades, that it was uh, tattered and worn down, so we've probably lost that canvas somewhere. But uh, at minimum, George Manwaring saw it. And George Manwaring was so impacted by it as a musician that he went back and he composed a song um, about the first vision. And we know that song is Joseph Smith's first prayer. And so as um, James Allen wrote, quote, it was thus four decades after the organization of the church that the first vision found its way into artistic media. But it was largely through these media that it eventually found its way into the hearts and minds of the saints. And I think that's just a great microcosm of a story of what happens when people decide to value something as a people. And then when their artists pick up that torch of what's valued and visually represented to get people to see it further and more clearly. And so uh, that's what I wanted to say to you, each of you who have produced art for this corpus. Um, thank you for creating culture. You've created culture. Isn't that a cool thought? Uh, to get the Book of Mormon better into the hearts and the minds of Latter-day Saints. Uh, we're at a pivot point with the Book of Mormon right now, in my view, where the Book of Mormon is being explored in ways and seen in ways, examined, in ways that it's never been done before. And we've probably only cracked the surface with it. And because we've barely cracked the surface of it, I think we've only cracked the surface of it with our art as well. And I'm excited to see what uh, this current generation of artists, the next generation of artists, and as the church continues to value the Book of Mormon, to see what its artists do uh, to create that cyclical culture of increasing value and understanding in the Book of Mormon. I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.